All right. Today I have with me Chris Bruntlett, who is the Marketing and Communication Manager at the Dutch Cycling Embassy, a public-private partnership that represents the best knowledge, experience, and experts from the Netherlands. As a longtime campaigner in Vancouver, he fell in love with Dutch bike culture in 2016, inspiring him to co-author the book, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vit Vitality. Chris uses his knowledge and passion to share practical lessons for global cities wishing to follow their footsteps and become better places to live, work, and of course, cycle. In 2019, Melissa and Chris, along with their children, Coralie and Etienne, re relocated from Vancouver, Canada to Delft, the Netherlands. Melissa now works with Mobicon, a bicontinental mobility con consultancy, supporting the promotion of Dutch transport knowledge, policy, and design principles in, in countries across Europe and North America. Welcome, Chris. I really appreciate you doing this with me. And uh, um, I don't know, before we get started, do you have anything to say? Um, no, I, I think it, it's always surreal to me still now after working for the Dutch Cycling Embassy for four years um, as a native Canadian uh, that's now in the business of exporting Dutch cycling culture. Uh, I still pinch myself, uh, you know, and ask how the heck did this happen to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I guess this is the way I want to try and tackle this conversation. Um, the first part, I wanted to basically ask you... Um, a few of the personal curiosity based questions um as an india a person of indian origin i've always had curiosity about the west in general as to how um cities are built uh communities are built neighborhoods are built road infrastructure and so forth and how amazing they're built in general and then the second part i want to um get into the um get into the book that the, your most recent book uh, that i want to talk about um and kind of like I've made some notes as to what I think that I want to delve into um, about the about designing cities around bike, you know, biking and so forth. Um, we'll do that as a second part, and then the third part. I guess I'll I'll leave to kind of I don't know if we're going to get at the third part, but that's how I want to structure it, Chris. So, getting into the first part, uh, this is my personal curiosity. And please indulge me if you can, and you don't have to if you if you don't want to. Um, I've I'm an immigrant from India, uh, immigrated to the U.S. and traveled a little bit in Europe and in Australia and so forth. One of the biggest things I've noticed, Chris, is um, just the the sheer design and the beauty of these cities that have been built. Um, and you know, coming from India, there's there's all sorts of challenges growing up. And, you know, I come from a big city as Bangalore, um, which was still kind of building out infrastructure and so forth. But what is it about the West? And this is kind of a broad, open-ended question. What is it about the West that you guys can build amazing streets and clean streets and well, you know, cobble streets that are clean? You know, there's an orderliness, there's an organized nature to things. Um this is something that I always wanted to ask somebody from the West. And and one of the reasons why I got on Google and searched for people to talk to in this in this area is like I I do, of course, talk to people in the Midwest um, and ask them questions. But I wanted to know from an expert who does this for a living, uh, maybe give the weigh in on that. Like what what is it about the West or the Western thought or um, the mindset um, that produces this kind of prolific um infrastructure prolific and beautiful and all of that stuff like could you weigh in on that <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, we're, we're starting off with a with a hardball question yes uh, sorry an existential question <laughs> <laughs> yes it's it sort of yes um no i i think a, a a culture's uh priorities can be seen in its streets and um for the west at least uh, after the second world war its priorities were moving cars uh, and the people inside those cars uh, as quickly, as efficiently as possible. Um, and so vast amounts of resources were spent uh, designing, engineering, and building these streets that, uh, well, some of them move tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of big metal boxes in a day. And that's not... an easy fate. It requires uh, decades of 
innovation and experimentation and 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 investment of billions if not trillions uh in in resources um the fact of the matter is yeah a lot of cities in the west uh after the war people started moving to the outskirts of the city uh in in suburbs and residential areas on the perimeter of the city and so uh the streets were designed uh, uh or should i say redesigned um to bring as many commuters in and out of the city as possible uh um largely to get to and from their jobs uh, in the offices which were in the city center um so you know i think um beauty is obviously in, in the eye of the beholder when yeah. i vi- when i visit america or canada i just see asphalt <laughs> uh, you know these asphalt canyons that are uh choked with cars and and um uh, and i think you know here in the netherlands and in other european cities um there's a beauty to the streets here which is very different there's a human scale to those streets the bricks the cobblestones the canals the bridges the the light posts uh, everything's built at a more human scale because they didn't demolish their cities and rebuild them around the car uh they didn't invest at least to to the scale of uh the united states or canada uh invest in this car centric infrastructure uh which by the way is is incredibly expensive to not just build but maintain and uh you know a lot of uh governments and 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 uh uh countries find themselves now just uh struggling to keep up with the maintenance bill but at the time the car was the mode of the future uh this was how people everybody was going to move around the city and only now 50 or 60 years later i think we're starting to run into some problems some challenges and an understanding that uh the car never really de- delivered on this promise of freedom and uh uh prosperity to everybody uh and that's what drives us now to build more walking cycling and public transportation into the urban fabric um so that it's not just a car centered mobility system well, about the european streets was it do you i mean since we're speaking a little bit of historical context here pre world war 2 was it have the streets always been the way they have been like in terms of like how aesthetically i don't know pe- me personally speaking i find it aesthetically pleasing i i visited uh netherlands back in 2011 and i i i honestly thought this was like a little bit like built by elves you know just yeah, everything yeah. is just shined and just kept up properly there's not a brick out of place um is that always been a like like a product of culture um or or is it more of a uh, you know like you mentioned um th- there has been this kind of emphasis on on livable s- cities and and more centered around people interacting with each other uh, walkable uh, walkways and bicycling pathways and so forth is it is it that in the in the US and Canada is it the curse of um I don't know if it's the curse but it, is it just because we started off with a blank slate post world war 2 in a sense not 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 necessarily a blank slate but um I I don't know I'm just always mesmerized by the, the just the european by the way there's there's noise in the background there's construction going on in my house so I apologize for that um if there's <laughs> if there's noise here folks I I truly apologize we we're, we're actually putting the roof right above my head so that there's a, okay um i i apologize for that um yeah so it's just like to me uh when i look at it it's just piques my curiosity that how is this even possible like um that yeah. you you've also maintained i mean the europeans have also maintained that uh ever since i i, I don't have any historical context about one of the things i was uh, researching a while ago was they said uh, one of the reasons why you find european cities um, as clean as they are as pretty as they are is because of the black plague back in the 14th century was that they narrowed it down to uh, hygiene standards and they said well it wiped out half the Euro- uh, half the population in europe and they basically decided hey henceforth one of the big things we're going to do henceforth is um try and keep our cities clean and hygiene became part of the culture so i don't know if you if you want to comment yeah. on any any of that well i think it, and we refer to uh 
World War II was a, a kind of a tipping point uh, or a turning point in a lot of ways. I think before the Second World War, streets generally around the world were seen as places for people to spend time, uh, to interact with their neighbors, for children to play on the streets. Um, and it's only uh, after the car reaches this critical mass after the Second World War, the traffic engineers start to take control of the planning process, that streets go from a place to stay to a place to pass through. And they serve one function, and that is to get people uh, from A to B as quickly as possible. And it's this paradigm shift that I think has resulted in a lot of the cities that we see today. And we can't talk really about Europe as this one uh, amorphous sure. blob because um, a lot of cities in Germany and the UK were that were destroyed during the war uh, rebuilt themselves around the car. There's a, a few cities here in the Netherlands like Rotterdam and Eindhoven, Nijmegen, that also sustained a lot of damage and uh, rebuilt themselves around the private automobile. And uh, um, it's, uh, you know, to their credit, they recognized, I think after 20 or 30 years, uh, that there were, it was a dead end, that they were uh, creating this lack of safety, this, uh, uh, the pollution and, and all the problems that come with car oriented development um, and started retrofitting uh, and redesigning the streets and spaces back to uh well uh maybe not necessarily places to stay but places where you could move different modes of transportation mm. pedestrian cyclists trams and and so on so it's uh yeah i i think uh <laughs> uh really interesting to think of uh um well it, it was this uh as i said the car was the mode of transportation of the future yeah uh it, it was obviously a very very well funded uh, uh, from the automobile industry, from the tire manufacturers, from the road manufacturers, from the car manufacturers, uh, to convince politicians and engineers that this was the right thing to do. And um, let's let's uh, acknowledge the fact that in a lot of American cities in particular, but also in Canada, um, a lot of uh, immigrant populations and uh, African-American populations were displaced um, to build the freeways and the parking lots and the mm. uh, and the infrastructure that was needed to get people in and out of the suburbs, and so I think, um, yeah, this this idea it was called urban renewal at the time, uh, making the city great for the car uh, meant that it was done on the backs of those that were less fortunate, and and they were, uh, and a lot of times in a lot of places. Uh, their neighborhoods were demolished to make way for uh, these these uh, vast asphalt canyons that were cutting uh, directly through the heart of the city. Mm. All right. Thanks for that. Um, I guess the second thing I want to move on to is your most recent book, fascinating book that I just read, Curbing Traffic, The Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives, um, where you lay out some of the things where traffic design and street design directly affects things from health to reducing pollution to traffic congestion to social trust and helping disabled reducing fatalities um helping older people live a more fulfilled life and so forth um really fascinating book chris uh i didn't ever think that some of the things that you laid out in your book would even be closely related you were talking about how Facing another person's car in the back, um, you know, reduces your sort of social trust and cohesion in a society. And it almost led to this kind of, in the US and UK at least, this sort of, uh, I don't know, if, you know, like a, a more of a disconnect between people. Um, th these are some huge, uh, I don't know, to me, it seems like these are huge claims. Are, are these... Um, and not claims, these are all backed by research, of course, but um, I guess this this is quite jaw-dropping. What was the reaction you got from people who read this book? Like, is it, I, a lot of things I read yeah. and I'm thinking, oh my God, it's just, it seems like the biggest tweak is the street design, the community design, and the, the way we design traffic and so forth will solve a big range of problems. <laughs> yeah, I think, as I was saying earlier, um, we we um built our cities around cars without really giving any thought to what the impacts that that would have and i think the interesting thing about us moving to the netherlands was 
um, we suddenly were living in a place with far fewer cars uh, in our lives. Our, our entire family was, and and it really got us thinking. You know, it, it's um, perhaps too simplistic to suggest that uh, the car, in and of itself, is responsible for uh, a decay in social trust, in a mm. decrease in childhood autonomy, in a mental health epidemic, in uh, yeah, lack of, of social trust and cohesion. Um, but it, I think it certainly plays a role. And what we tried to do was, yeah, bring research and talk to experts who had done uh, academic studies in this field to try and uh, thread this narrative that um, the car has, uh, of course, played a, a transformative role in terms of giving people mobility and, and access to opportunity and, uh, and and building prosperous cities. But what has the cost been? Well, the cost has been at uh, the health and happiness of our children because they're suddenly not able to navigate their own neighborhood independently uh, and they're reliant on mom and dad to get around. It's been at the uh, the the cost of um, us knowing our neighbors because uh, in communities where the car is dominant, we're less likely to talk to our neighbors or have friends and acquaintances on our street because the traffic uh, causes us to spend less time on our street. Um, to yeah, other uh, like uh, gendered mobility, this this idea that that uh, car based cities have been designed by men and for men, uh, and largely neglect the mobility needs of women who are still making statistically uh, a larger percentage of care trips. That is local uh, multi purpose trips to the grocery store, to school, to uh, yeah, and everywhere in between, and so. Um, yeah, we've 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 tried to thread this uh, this story about well, what we call the human case for fewer cars in our lives. Again, we're not arguing for car free cities by any stretch of the imagination. We're just um, questioning this uh, this default of of uh, everybody needs a car, everybody wants a car, everybody uh, has to rely on a car, and and, and making the case for. Um, more uh, balanced and diversified uh, mobility options in our in our cities and our communities, and I think, um, yeah, hopefully we've we've uh, we've changed the conversation in in some ways. You know, we we talk to uh, fellow advocates and decision makers, mayors, councillors, uh, other elected officials, and uh, I think you know, hopefully, it has given them talking points, ideas, inspiration that they need. Um, to make the change on the ground uh, and and bring up things that we're perhaps um, cognizant of, but don't necessarily know how to articulate or uh, even process. And I think noise pollution is one such thing. It, it fascinates us, this uh, the prevalence of noise pollution that the car creates, uh, not just the engines of, of, of cars, but the friction of tires on asphalt and the impacts that has us, uh, us physically and mentally. Uh, so we brought a lot of research to the table and, and uh, to hopefully change this conversation because uh, you know there's noise pollution has been a, a priority here in the Netherlands in terms of its reduction through the design of its streets and cities, uh, and the result is a much more pleasant and healthy uh, urban environment, and uh, you know. So I think, uh, yeah, these are all kind of ideas that came to us the, uh, it, through the first year of living in the Netherlands, and we just had to uh, try to, uh, to share its story uh, through our own firsthand experiences, but also by talking to uh, academics in the field in order to try and back up our feelings with some facts. Yeah, so as a, as a cycling advocate, I would say, uh, like, have you known what i mean we're almost borderline talking sacrilegious stuff right like we're you know cars we, we got to move to you know cycling and cars cause all this pollution and noise and so forth like how much like how open were people to ideas of the ideas you were presenting in the book um was it did it take a lot of i mean i don't know how much you've done so far but how how difficult was it to convince another country that really needs to implement this, um, I got I asked this from like a perspective of like a Indian person as well, where you know you talk about no noise and one of the I guess it's a cultural thing 
I, I mean, I was there recently a couple of months ago. The honking is incessant. Um, it's just we wake from four in the morning till about 11 at night, you're just going to hear honking. And I ask people around like, Hey, why do you have to honk? When I drive on the streets, I count the number of times I honk. This is in India, but by no means this is, I'm casting aspersions on my fellow countrymen, but it seems to me that it's a lot of it is unnecessary. Like I, I really don't have to honk. I just have to use common sense, a little bit of eye contact, uh, intuition and so on. When I ask people, they say, First thing they say is, well, we're approaching a junction. You always want to preemptively honk. Um, you you never know who's speeding by, and therefore it's this sort of lack of trust that you have to honk. And so it's just everybody does it, right? And and so I'm thinking this is quite a heavy lifting task, right? Like as to when, when you're advocating for um, more you know, mobility using cycling and other modes of, of transport versus cars. Um, I mean, we're talking, this is a long, are you thinking this is a long-term sort of thing, advocacy thing, or um, I guess, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. I think every uh, city, every, uh, uh, yeah, every person that you speak to is going to have their own uh, priorities, values, and 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 pressure points. And if you can speak to them in their language and address their specific concerns, uh, that you can sometimes bring them along to what you're advocating for. And if it's um, you know childhood mobility, I think uh, you know if they have young children themselves, then you can have a conversation with them about how they moved around the city themselves. Uh, and how perhaps now through to a, a lack of safety and and, and uh, that their own children don't enjoy that same freedom and independence. Um, I think this idea of, of everybody having the rights of the city is a very powerful one. And I think this is one of the, the major themes of the book and what people have reacted to uh, on social media and, and otherwise is um, this idea that you need to have the physical and financial means to own and operate a car just to participate in society is incredibly mm. exclusionary. It, it, it excludes uh, children for the first 16 to 18 years of their lives. It excludes the elderly population who can, who will outlive their ability to drive safely for seven to 10 years. It excludes people with disabilities that maybe can't uh, buy and, and na uh, use a uh, adapted car. It, excludes women who disproportionately don't have access to a car more than when men it excludes people with lower incomes that don't have 12,000 US dollars per year uh, to put into gas maintenance insurance parking etc and so when it's all said and done it's almost half of our population of our cities um, can't participate in society they can't go to the doctor or the dentist or a community center or a friend's house without um, you know, relying on their their friends or relatives for a drive, or uh, you know, a bus that maybe shows up every uh, hour, if if at all. Uh, and it's it's just an incredibly unjust uh, mobility system that we've built by assuming that everybody has access to a car and a driver's license. Do do people when you when you advocate for these sort of things with officials of uh, different countries and different societies? Do do they do they push back on this idea that it's unjust? Like you're framing it as unjust. And to me, um, it seems that's quite that's quite a bold, <laughs> like a, a bold assertion. You're, you're talking about, uh, you know, cars being or, or cars almost engendering or fostering this environment of being unjust. And it, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um but the, I can't imagine the amount of pushback you get. By the way, you're you're um, when you say Dutch Cycling Embassy, would you be like considered the ambassador of the embassy? Would you be considered a person who's? Yeah. Um, well, could could uh... you speak about that? By the way, just a quick <laughs> quick tangent there, if you if you if you will, please, Chris, is that what is the Dutch sure. Cycling Embassy? What do you? What is the mission? Why is it called the Dutch Cycling Embassy? Can you can you talk to that? 
Yeah, uh, of course. So, um, well, we're a, a, an NGO, a non-government organization that was started by the national government here in the Netherlands, the Ministry of Infrastructure, specifically to export the knowledge and expertise that exists in this country. So, you know, they were getting lots of requests for cooperation and information from other foreign governments. Mm -hmm. Rather than handle them themselves, they decided to set up this external entity entity. Uh, and we now work with cities, governments, regions around the world to help them learn from the Dutch, uh, apply Dutch principles onto their own streets. Um, and uh, yeah, we're a network based organization. So we have almost 100 Dutch uh, consultancies, universities, municipalities, uh, pr bicycle producers, bicycle parking manufacturers that we can all bring to the table whenever we get a request. And uh, so it takes the form of um, just email exchanges, webinars, uh, virtual workshops, physical workshops, study visits. Um, but at the end of the day, we are yeah, sharing all the great knowledge this country has as, as in a, you know, a field that they've been working in for several decades now and, and have this kind of wisdom and experience to impart on the world. So it's uh it's quite a special role that we have, you know, a role of, of leadership and uh, tutorage that we're able to, uh, uh, but we're able to work in some pretty special and unique locations, uh, including, uh, yeah, all over the global South, Europe, uh, North America. Uh, my colleague is off to Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam next week. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's really broad, diverse uh, and exciting job uh, for sure. I wouldn't call myself an ambassador. I am one of, uh, you know, 10 uh, staff at the DCE, but uh, I, I do have quite a special role as the marketing and communication manager. I am kind of the, the external face uh, of the organization and handle a lot of the external communication. Yeah, that's a very fascinating thing that the Dutch, um, I guess that was one of the things you, you, you make a point that the Dutch believe in or very egalitarian in nature they they uh one of the comments uh, uh you made I, i'm trying to look for it in the in the notes they um they don't believe everybody is equal but um was it it, it made a it, it really uh, yeah, hit yeah, yeah. home uh, could uh, you speak not yeah 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 yeah, there's there's a saying in, in Dutch. I don't remember the exact uh, Dutch equivalents, but it basically says that we are not the same, but we're worth worth the same. the same. Yeah, yeah. So that everybody has, you know, not this necessarily the same uh, abilities or income or background, but they all have a seat at the table and all deserve to participate uh, in society and in in their mobility system and use their streets. And I think uh, this is another point that's been lost is that with the rise of fast moving heavy cars on the street it excludes uh, so many other different type of road users because they just have to get out of the way of the uh, of the automobile was that a little bit of a culture shock when you moved from canada to the netherlands like you i'm sure it manifests in all walks of life that sort of egalitarian mentality Again, this is my curiosity talking. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I, I just yeah. want to know what your take is because I I look at this, Chris, and I say, I mean, these this is almost to me an idealist ideal society. Um, because I mean, from from all aspects, like if you're look, you know, in America, you've got um, all men are created equal, kind of like you know that that mentality that immediately uh, anybody who's bigoted about anything immediately sort of gets you know, gets checked in that sense. And I, and I look at what you're saying, it's, it's the next step where everybody's worth the same. And it's like, what a beautiful place to start at. And, and with that as the kind of the fundamental principle, there's a lot of beautiful things that can happen. You're, you're um, bringing everybody in to the foray uh, rather than the few privileged people. Um, I don't know. Was this a culture shock for you? Was this did did you did it take time for you to adjust? Um, you're, you're Canadian. I don't know what uh, your sensibilities yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, we'd spent enough time here that we knew what we were getting ourselves into, but that was time spent as tourists, as as visitors, and I think it's very different to 
uh, when you come here and you start finding an apartment and 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 uh, registering as a, a resident and uh, navigating the bureaucracy and the uh, various forms of it. But I think this comes back to your last question uh, that we didn't get to talk about was the uh, uh, the the framing of this as an unjust uh, system that we've built elsewhere. I think uh, I certainly wouldn't frame it that way in a conversation with a decision maker. Yeah, uh, I, I I'm all about bringing the positivity and and perhaps showing them and demonstrating through uh, well photography, video, or even better yet, bringing them to the Netherlands for a study visit. Mm. And showing them what a just and equal uh, society and, and road network looks like. You can see it on my background there. There's a, a woman cycling with her baby. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of people of color. What's missing uh, on this photo, but you see all the time here in the Netherlands, is uh, people in their 70s and 80s riding e-bikes. Mm -hmm. You will see people with, people with disabilities uh, with a cane strapped to their bicycle using uh, an electric tricycle or a hand cycle. Um, the diversity of people that are able to use their streets because they, again, not built car-free cities, but low-car cities, built in the traffic calming, built the infrastructure for people to use, um, that you see virtually everybody out there um, using the space and not feeling unsafe, uncomfortable, or unwelcome. And I think the biggest culture shock for us is, uh, uh, as Canadians who rode bikes regularly in Vancouver was just the courtesy of uh, drivers in particular, mm. where we were used to in Vancouver getting honked at, getting our, uh, uh, you know, getting engines revved at us uh, out of impatience because right. we were seen seen as a obstacle to somebody's right. uh, destination. And and here it's for many different reasons. Again, most drivers are also cyclists, so they. There's some empathy built into the system. The infrastructure is designed in a way to remove that conflict. Uh, in the four years that we've lived here, we've never gotten bullied, honked at, mm. engines revved, or anything because um, the various modes of traffic interact in a very harmonious. Mm. Now, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. You know, sure, don't get sure. me wrong. Uh, there are little micro conflicts and 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 other problems that are caused. Um, by the the high volume of people on the streets, but it really is, I think, uh, a model worth replicating and a uh, yeah, an ideal worth pursuing uh, elsewhere in the world because it does, as we, we were saying earlier, it bleeds into so many different psychological ways that are you know social cohesion, social trust, uh, mental health, physical health. Uh, we're we're all benefiting from. Uh, these types of changes and not just the people who get out there on two wheeled bicycles, but so many other different people as well. Yeah. So what, speaking about challenges to that, um, how would you square that up with like, let's say the Midwest, this is one thing, uh, you know, you go through extreme winters in Canada and the, in the Midwest, let's say in the U S uh, how do you scale this up to extreme temperature extreme climate areas like that because mm -hmm, biking is, mm -hmm. is 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 going to be a challenge right it is yeah but i think um you know the thing to remember is every context has its challenges mm -hmm. um but cycling is happening right now in ulu finland in within the you know uh, a few kilometers of the arctic circle mm -hmm. in the middle of winter where there's uh there's very few hours of sunlight freezing cold temperatures lots of snow because they've shown that if you build the infrastructure and you maintain it, people will use it. And it all comes down to the quality of the network uh, of infrastructure you put on the ground. There's research, there's studies that show that um, there's very little drop off uh, in instances of bad weather. Um, if the quality of infrastructure is high enough and you see oh, it here wow. in the Netherlands, uh, driving rain, 70 kilometer an hour headwinds, uh, freezing snow, uh, 40 plus uh, degrees Celsius summers, you know, stinking hot summers. Mm -hmm. People are out there, out there using the cycling infrastructure because they still have places to go. They still, uh, you know, need to keep doing what they're doing. Uh, they just adjust their clothing slightly and and mm. keep calm and and carry on. Now, I think the more uh, now, of course, yeah, the Netherlands has a, a fairly temperate climate and and is relatively flat. 
Uh, so cities that are more hilly or perhaps hotter uh, definitely do present a challenge. And maybe in those places, we're not going to get the 50 or 60 percent mode share that we see in Dutch cities. But if you go about it in a smart uh, and strategic way, if we're building uh, shade trees on our cycling paths, for example, to uh, because the temperature at, at, at street level is going to be much lower when you you build that tree coverage into your uh, cycling uh, network, um, you can certainly uh, mitigate a lot of these geographic challenges. And also the e-bike, of course, is is the next mm-hmm. great equalizer because it takes, uh, flattens hills, removes sweat from the equation and and removes a lot of the excuses that that cities might, might use to not build this great infrastructure. Hmm. Um- I guess, can I get into a little bit of your um, uh, past, Chris? Like, what what um, were your motivations to get into something like this? Like, how did you, was this a deliberate career path you took? Um, how, how did you come about to being a cycling advocate? Yeah, we, we often describe, Melissa and I, uh, our current career paths as cycling advocacy that got way out of control because... Um, it was never part of our plan. Melissa studied fashion in university. Wow. I did architecture. Um, I did my bachelor's in architecture. And I think, um, you know, we both worked in our respected fields for over a decade. And, and cycling was just a, a, a mode of transport to us initially, getting to and from the office each day. We were lucky enough to live within cycling distance of our work. Um, uh, from there, things kind of, uh, uh, got out of control because the city of Vancouver was at the time having a very, uh, existential discussion about cycle lanes and cyclists. And, um, we decided to interject our, our, our opinions and our stories on social media, Mm -hmm. uh, creating a blog and, and eventually producing videos and, that's what brought us to the Netherlands in 2016. Again, I was still working as an architect, Melissa in fashion. Um, and I think we we got here for a five-week holiday, a working holiday, where we were going to just write some blog posts uh, um, about what the Dutch could teach Vancouver. And it completely transformed us as people uh, being here. We, we saw what cities can, how they can function, how they can function for everyone. Uh, and and it really we got back to Vancouver uh, completely changed people and and that's what fueled the fire uh, in terms of writing that that first book building the cycling city and um, eventually you know caught the attention of, of the Dutch cycling embassy and Mobicon respectively and and landed us these these jobs in the Netherlands so uh, you know it's a, it was an overnight uh, success story uh, that took fifteen or twenty years. Uh, but we're now, you know, really both lucky enough to uh, get paid to, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, to do our passions uh, and really couldn't ask for uh, anything more than that. Wow. So you went back to Canada and you wrote about it. You wrote the book and then that gave you that sort of, you know, meteoric rise, so to speak, into your career that you that you have right now. Wow. Um yeah, this I guess as a advocate, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place. So excuse me here. One of the things I wanted to ask you is like somebody like myself, like I, this is quite dear to my heart because one of the things I noticed my my grandmother, she's she's no more, but in her late 80s, early 90s, her mobility became almost virtually zero um, because she lived in Chennai, which is a big city huge population. Um, one thing I noticed, I, I visited Chennai every year for the last 16 years now. The sidewalks got narrower and narrower and narrower to the point where you there's not even a, a walkway This the width of two, two people. It's just like barely one person. And then there's, as you're walking through the sidewalks, there's... Um, everything in the world you can imagine like a power box power junction box to a you know trash can to fill in the blank and um what is it that if if somebody like myself had to advocate um for 
you know, a better design? What is it that some somebody like myself can do about it? Like, you know, I, somebody as somebody who's out out of the you know city municipal corporation and so forth. Like, one, of course, I'm doing this conversation so I could spread it amongst people and spread the awareness that there is a different way of approaching mobility. Uh, there is a different way of designing a city that makes it more friendly to all age groups um, and is more equitable for everybody. Uh, is it, uh, Do you have any, I don't know, intuitions or recommendations on how I could go about, uh, you know, can I, can I contact the municipal corporation and say, look, this is a playbook from the Dutch folks and they do it damn well. <laughs> and yeah. maybe we, we ought to take a few plays from their playbook. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I you know, um... and I, by the way, just to add, my the, the the point about my grandmother was like I noticed her spirit diminishing over the yeah, last ten yeah. years. Like I could sense clearly that she wasn't able to go to the store. One of the things she would do, uh, which was so, such a loving thing, in her eighties, she would just walk up to the street uh, end of the street, go get some fish and fix it for me because she hadn't seen me in a year or something like that. It was very endearing, and then I noticed. Uh, distinctively, di distinctively, when that stopped, it was like the roads widened, her mobility just vanished, um, and I imagine that's for yeah. almost the entire um, elderly population. Um, it, it's it's almost again an existential sort of a thing. It's it's and and the and the kind of the points you're making in your book is that these are things that will these are like low hanging fruit. We should do this fairly quickly and we this will give give us return on investment fairly fairly soon yeah yeah no i i, I it, it really i think everybody has one of those stories right you, mm -hmm. as you watch your grandparents or your parents get older um you see what uh, a reduction in mobility does to them and i i shared uh a little bit of my own experience in in a chapter of curbing traffic with my grandfather who he himself uh, hit his uh, early 80s and his driver's license was taken away uh, and uh, he spiraled into a form of depression, you know, mm -hmm. because he and my he and my grandmother could no longer do their ballroom dancing classes, mm -hmm. uh, which was their social and physical outlet without getting one of their elderly sons to come and pick them up. And the, the, the frustrating thing is this was in uh, the UK, which is only a few hundred kilometers from here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't help but think if, uh, you know, if uh, they had this, uh, these mobility choices built into the fabric of their city, um, they perhaps would have lived longer, happier lives. But as soon as the driver's license takes, is taken away, for a lot of people, it can be, you know, a uh, really devastating experience. Mm -hmm. um, back to your original question, though. Uh, yeah, the uh advice for what people can do i think is to just find your community and connect with like-minded people i think um social media has been really great for that uh and for us um building a community on twitter was uh really a game changer in terms of um yeah connecting with people not just in vancouver when we were working in vancouver but also in cities all around the world uh sharing ideas inspiration information uh, we'll see how long Twitter lasts, unfortunately, but you know, there's, <laughs> there's LinkedIn, there's uh, Instagram, there's Facebook, uh, there's Mastodon now and, and, and other social media uh, outlets, um, but also finding your community within your community, if you will. So uh, I think there are uh, probably plenty of people that, again, intuitively understand these, these ideas. If there's not a cycle advocacy group or a safe streets group uh, in your particular community uh and i would suggest you google it um start one and and see what you can attract in terms of interest uh, and try to shift the conversation uh in your hometown that's ultimately what melissa and i were just trying to do we were trying to uh mm -hmm. um uh, affect the conversation that was happening in vancouver and and it took us places far beyond our wildest imagination there's no guarantee that it will be happen to everyone of course but if your heart's in it, if your passion is in it, and and yeah, if you really truly want to make a change, I guess the worst thing that can happen is you do make that change, and and maybe you can create a career out of it, or uh, at least a real uh, you know rewarding uh, passion uh, project uh, uh, that you can do in and around paid employment. Yeah, um, 
that's that's great advice chris and it i think it takes a lot of i don't know not idealism but you, you have to be passionate about it um and almost selfless in a sense that you know if you're if you want to organize your society like i'm i'm I, by the way i'm looking at it all through the lens of my fellow indians cuz i um th- that's been one of my biggest hobby horses for the last 15 plus years 20 years since i immigrated to the us it's that how do i uh, import ideas from wherever the ideas are doesn't matter if it's from the west or the east but idea good ideas are good ideas and stand on their own uh, merit and um yeah so th- this this is something you know one of the things that that I it's worth mentioning I, I, in in this conversation is that there there is also this sort of um as india has a c- colonial past to it uh, there's a little bit of like always suspicion about anything that comes from the west um uh, you know whenever i talk about some good ideas that are implemented in in, in america or europe or whatever it is um there is well that works for there it doesn't work for here kind of uh b- because we have uh you know a lot of diversity different languages and and so on they fill in the blank there's there's a myriad of reasons why these are not scalable to a country like india um but i'm a hopeless romantic at the same time i i i do believe that ideas are ideas you implement it anywhere uh you can obviously you you probably obviously need to customize it to the local um uh s- local situation but good ideas are good ideas i mean we have historical precedent to this japan and south korea are two countries that copy pasted a lot of the blueprint of american ideas to implement their so- implement in their societies in terms of infrastructure and so forth as as far as i've read um So anyway, I'm just rambling on here talking about yeah. making your point in a sense. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Well, and I do actually have a really practical uh, example of of uh, the Dutch cycling embassy working in India. Okay. Um and it's uh as you said, it's I think um not necessarily uh parachuting in there and 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 telling people what they can and can't do, but through um an organization called ITDP, which is the uh Institute for Transportation and Development Policy they have an office in Chennai uh actually hmm. um during the 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 pandemic they initiated uh, a, a nationwide contest uh, uh, called Cycles for Change cycles and then the number 4 uh change and and myself and and other members of the Dutch Cycling Embassy uh advised on that project and we were uh on the uh, design jury that ultimately selected the winners but the the hope was to encourage cities across india with this blank canvas of of empty streets and and this quote unquote opportunity that covid presented to just try things and and to build some pop up bike lanes build up build some uh place making build some uh traffic calming try things out and uh document the process to collect some feedback mm-hmm. and then pre- present a plan to itdp about you know what that process looked like and how it might be scaled up uh in the future and the response was phenomenal they had over 100 cities across india participate from coast to coast uh border to border mm. and um i there 25 uh finalists were selected and they all presented to the jury 11 were selected as quote unquote winners who will now receive support guidance and resources they need um to train their engineers and planners on these principles and best practices again not copy and pasting from the netherlands but being inspired and informed uh by the, the these uh these ideas uh and hopefully you know uh building uh permanent networks of infrastructure out of this pop up uh experiment that happened during the coronavirus crisis so it's it was really quite special to be a part of and and you know now we're in the planning phase where we're hopefully going to execute some workshops in india mm. uh directly directly with the people on the ground that are working and implementing these projects and uh teaching them through exercises through case studies through um you know real life examples how to um yeah combine these ideas in a very different context of course i think the the most 
mind-blowing thing that um, I was told when we were talking to people in Bengaluru was that there are 38 different varieties of traffic on their streets, mm, yeah, which yeah. is uh, totally different from the Dutch context. So making sense and creating order from that is obviously going to be a next level challenge uh, using these Dutch principles, but uh, we're definitely going to give it a try and, and hopefully uh, we get some successes and are able to make some change on the ground in the months and years ahead. Yeah. It's uh, when you said Bangalore, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from Bangalore and, one of the things I, I, you know, I always wonder is that as far as implementing some of the ideas, the, I mean, of course, the population is really high. There's a de density of population and, and the housing and all of that gets uh, built up as a result of the demand for housing. And the streets are fairly narrow and they're only designed for mostly cars and, and, and bikes and so and motorbikes and so forth any intuitions you have on how we could sort of build a biking lane in in in, in that are we are we talking building underground building above the ground i mean from a practical standpoint what is maybe could you suggest what specific thing we could do do, do you have any intuitions on that as to as to solving that problem because i i could see uh, in a busy street, for example, in Bangalore, like if you, if we introduced walk lanes as well as biking lanes, that would be that would alleviate a lot of pain. Uh, we're talking, we're alleviating noise pollution, air pollution, of course, and and, and just mobility across the board. Because, um, like you mentioned, you know the, the the cost of ownership of a car is tremendous. It's it's we're not even taking into account insurance and maintenance and all of that. Um, and India being a relatively poor country, like biking would be awesome. Walking, you know, walking safely would be awesome. The, any any intuitions on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's important to stress that even here in the Netherlands, not every street has a bike lane. In fact, mm. probably two thirds of the cycling network is um, not with segregated infrastructure. It's more mixed traffic conditions. Now, there's a very okay. big asterisk on on that mixed traffic condition it's that you know for the most part through traffic is filtered out of of those local streets sure. um so that you it's not it's seen as a or used as a thoroughfare for uh motor vehicles uh and and the speeds need to be reduced i mean uh 80 of the uh urban streets here in the netherlands are 30 kilometers an hour or slower that's what 18 miles per hour or less um, and those are the the preconditions for uh, getting more people cycling within their neighborhood. Uh, and that's, I think, the point where we need to start is not necessarily getting everybody to cycle for every journey across the city, mm -hmm. but thinking, think, making the bike an option for the journey to school, the journey to the corner store, the journey to friends' houses, the journey to the public transportation uh, stop or station. Uh, and then if we start with those short journeys – then we can look at the uh, the bigger infrastructures uh, that are necessary on those larger distributor roads, arterial roads, uh, to make them possible. But those obviously take a lot more time, a lot more resources, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 uh, some bold political uh, choices. But if if we start with that that filtering and traffic calming at the neighborhood level, and this is one thing that the Cycles for Change project specifically tried to do was show what what local streets, residential streets can be like if we just um, remove some of that through traffic and, and make it possible for people to walk, cycle and even play uh, on their on the space outside their front door. Um, so that's uh, where I would definitely start. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, there is so much potential. Um, if you start with those small journeys and, and um, the connection between cycling and public transportation is another uh, topic that we are already talking to uh, Bangalore about specifically, mm. because right now they're in the process of building a multi-billion uh, uh, dollar uh, metro system uh, with very little consideration about how people arrive at the stations and leave right. the stations. And I think... Uh, one thing that we've tried to help them understand is, uh, well, the potential of attracting more passengers and more customers onto their trains. Um, 
if they link cycling and uh, the metro system as one continuous, seamless mode of transport, providing some bike parking at the stations, providing maybe a bike sharing or rental service on the other end of their journey. Um, it's a win-win scenario when you start uh, looking at this more holistically rather than just saying we're going to build a metro and, and, and without any consideration to yeah, how their, the passengers arrive or depart uh, from their stop or station. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking as you were talking about how we could make the existing infrastructure how you could imp like implement controls around the existing roads, for example, to make it more biker friendly or pedestrian friendly. I'm thinking from an Indian standpoint, uh, it would require almost like a holistic change as far as law enforcement goes, for example. You know, we're talking guys who are speeding more than 30 kilometers per hour need to be held accountable. Like that, we, we need to upgrade that aspect of it, the, the law enforcement aspect of it so that, there's a there's a cost you bear because you've violated a particular rule. Um, I I do see signs in Bangalore, for example, in busy streets. They'll say, you know, 50 kilometers per hour limit, and literally nobody is following 50 kilometers per hour. Um, it is free for all, and yeah, I, I just this is my two cents. Is that it's almost like a societal upgrade um of, of of a variety of different things before we i don't know before we get there uh, everything from law enforcement to um making cycling a less uh, uh you know a stigmatized way of way of transportation because cycling in india is also you know, it's a, there's a class-based society in India. Their cycling is not viewed as the most prestigious thing uh, as well. Um, there's there's that. There's um, Anyway, that that's just uh, my two cents anyway. Um, of course, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you had anything to say add to that. But it's just there is no silver bullet. And, and yeah, there's, uh, you know, kind of maybe 10 or 15 things you need to be doing simultaneously, right. including marketing, communication, outreach, engagement, um, selling cycling as a desirable and enjoyable mode of transport while you're building the infrastructure. Um, yeah, and and uh, educating and uh, enforcing and uh, yeah, encouraging behavior change. Uh, I mean, there's all these soft measures mm -hmm. uh, that need to be done in addition to the hard uh, infrastructure that that needs to be built. Yeah, um, one thing that coming back to the book that really resonated with me, uh, Chris, is that you talk a lot about um, how nature or being in nature is the has such an effect on our mood, on our productivity, on our general health, and and so forth. Um, I have a house here in the Midwest, and I've been blessed to have this house where it's just facing a ravine with full of trees, wooded area, and everything. And ever since I moved here in 2017, um, it's just it's been a massive shift for me in terms of my mood, um, the way. You know, I, I joke with my wife often that this house is like like a shock absorber for our stress. You know, it it just absorbs and it just absorbs. It's so unconscious too. Um, I don't know what what your thoughts are about that. Like in terms of, um, could could you speak to that in terms of? I, I don't know. It seems underrated to me because, it, for example, if I go to work um, where I work at, uh, you're stuck in a brown cubicle. And there's barely any nature around it. So even in developed countries, as well as um, de de developing countries, there's this, I don't think there's this appreciation that nature is the one that's like the, a huge antidote for, for a lot of, you know, different, you know, from mood to heart disease and so on. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and I think it's maybe something we all gained a newfound appreciation for during the pandemic when sure. we were locked down in our in our houses and um, uh, the idea of getting outside and and uh, going for a walk or a bike ride or whatever uh, in nature was became a lot of people's release and and step away from the stressful Zoom calls and familial situations mm -hmm. uh, that they found themselves locked in 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 their house, but. 
Um, yeah, it, I think uh, it's another kind of area where we try to uh, tie a bit of a connection between, um, well, uh, reduced mental and physical health and, and the design of cities around cars, which require a tremendous amount of base and asphalt and, uh, and, and uh, well, really take away the ability to build more green space, more opportunities for restoration, reflection, and decompression uh, within our cities. And that's parks, forests, uh, rivers, uh, and so on. A lot of cities, if they had historic rivers, maybe they filled them in to build expressways. Uh, the same was, uh, it was true of, of Seoul in, in Korea, for example. Uh, and they've, uh, well, the really uh, amazing, inspiring places like Seoul, like Utrecht here in the Netherlands, um, having filled in their their rivers and canals with the motorway in recent years, they've uh, put the uh, the waterway back and and mm. given it back to the people and and uh, removed the the asphalt and uh, it becomes a place for people to gather and and uh, well I'm lucky enough to actually work uh, along uh, the Catherine Singel in Utrecht where they they did exactly that and it's become a, a great lunch spot for. Uh, for us uh, to to sit on the river and uh, on the nicer days and um, yeah, I mean all the benefits that you you you've spelled out and and I think scientists and academics are still trying to understand that connection. Uh, but there's something about being in nature, and it can just be walking through the forest. It can be, uh, or it can be hiking in the in the mountains um that that gives us this um this rest it has this restorative effect on us both physically and mentally uh that that is perhaps underappreciated and and under acknowledged so the more opportunities we can provide uh within our city or close to our city uh to make sure that those opportunities are can be accessible to everybody uh and and so that you're not driving your car out to some remote location but you can maybe go for a walk in your neighborhood and, and enjoy the same restorative effects. Yeah. As you were saying this, I I was thinking about one of the points you make in the book is that we handed over the road design aspect of things to engineers who are looking at it from purely a transportation and car of getting from A to B, optimizing the time and so forth. We should probably look at look at it more holistically or integrate more departments together to come up with this design to to bring to the table you know bring to the table like health experts and and so on so that you're um it's it's more of an integrated approach where you're just not optimizing on one thing but you're you're optimizing on several things and that would lead to the best results i and i thought that was such a such a cool point it it go, it, it just really it hit 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 home for me as an engineer because that's been the place where I've seen the most um, value or or innovation happens. Then, which because you're you're pulling ideas from disparate fields, which you initially your intuition doesn't really offer you as an engineer. But then, as you're looking at all these various factors and different teams interacting with each other, it results in sort of the optimal design, the best design possible. Uh, to me, it seems like the very underappreciated fact of of anything yeah. of just city yeah. building or, um, yeah. And that's uh, I think yeah, it, it's unfortunately we are compartmentalized and mm -hmm. siloed and 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 don't talk to each other. And the example I provided earlier about the public transportation planners not talking to the cycling planners results in in issues such as that. But it can be. Um, really powerful for us at, at, with the Dutch Cycling Embassy when we host these workshops uh, with local stakeholders is we do try to get everybody at the table and talking to each other. And in a lot of ways, it can spark these conversations between uh, people that don't normally interact or mm -hmm. exchange ideas or, or uh, knowledge with each other and, and can form the start of, of, of some special uh, relationships. So we're definitely... Uh, keen advocates for more consensus building and cooperating, uh, especially in the, the field of city building. Do, yeah. Do you see like there's friction when that sort of thing happens? Because there's there's this kind of like, um, there's, I imagine there's because of the silos, there's also distrust. There's um, 
you know people acting in self interest and so forth uh, this happens both in corporate in a corporate environment as well as like you know in a city corporation like how do you break down those walls like how do you say hey everybody is kind of in on this um and i like the earlier point you made that this is a phased approach you can't just solve the problem in one fell swoop um you you have to sort of chew the elephant one at a time um i mean yeah. there's yeah, a lot what's that so go ahead we're we're eating a big f and elephant at the moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good analogy actually yeah <laughs> um it, no it's i i think it's a tremendous point and and um uh, uh, generally, our experience has been really positive. I think everybody is pushing for the same thing, which is, of course, more livable and equitable uh, and sustainable cities. Um, but it really is just finding the common ground and the win-win scenarios. And, and the public transport cycling one, again, is a great example because the public transportation system is getting more passengers. The cycle lanes are potentially getting more cyclists. Uh, so it is really this, this win-win in a scenario where if if they opposed each other or saw, saw each other as competitors initially, it was just due to a lack of understanding or knowledge about uh, the, the the benefits that each other can bring. So I think if we find and, and communicate those uh, those win win scenarios, then we can uh, ultimately get everybody on board uh, to this this greater vision and mission. Do you, um, as a follow up to that, when you work with other folks from other countries and so forth do you do you have to do a little bit of i don't know studies or research into their cultural underpinnings of a particular society a country so that you tailor the message specific to a country um i guess how do you go about that this is just a broad question it doesn't have to be i guess what are your experiences with that i this is just a i don't know a tactical tip that i would like to <laughs> for you to talk on yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, absolutely. Yeah, it does require a lot of research preparation meetings, discussions uh, beforehand. But um, I think the important thing, and I, I hinted at this earlier, is we're working for and with a local party. So it's not necessarily the Dutch cycling embassy dropping in and, and telling things, uh, you know, telling people how it should be done. But through uh, a consultant or an organization that is on the ground working in that city, familiar with the context, the, the opportunities, the challenges, um, that we can uh, ultimately find uh, the the principles and the strategies that are going to work uh, and and the approaches and and make sure that we're not excluding anyone or we're not uh, you know uh, uh, neglecting or or forgetting about any uh, any part of this very complicated puzzle and it's so it's uh, it's always important to have a local partner on the ground and and we couldn't do this and we wouldn't do it without. Uh, such uh, such local expertise and and the partnerships we form with various organizations. Yeah. Um, well, Chris, I want to be sensitive to your time as well. Uh, I don't know how long we've been going here, maybe an hour, something like that, hour, 10 minutes. Um, I'd, I'd like to wrap it up. If, um, unless, um, I guess, uh, did you have anything else to say? I, I certainly appreciate your time being here, talking to a, I don't know, a rookie who's just interested in in several things. Uh, uh, like uh, th this book was very, very eye opening for me, I should say. Um, you know, you talked you talked about like the social distrust aspect of things. And I'm thinking, are people reading this stuff? Is this is like quite gr groundbreaking that you know what happened in the US USA and the UK as far as like just general distrust in society um is bred by the fact that you're looking at or 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 at least is influenced by the fact that you're looking at somebody's uh car you're in your soundproof cabin with glass and steel separating you and then they just sort of breeze this distrust and stuff like that like it it really changed my mind so um <laughs> i really appreciate you for writing that book and and bringing all these ideas to the table. This is um, something that I'll always carry and advocate for. And um, I, I look forward to sharing with my fellow fellow countrymen. So I, I really thank you. And you're a, truly a treasure, Chris. Appreciate it. 
Well, I really appreciate that. And, and thank you so much for having me. And thanks for the great questions. It's been a really uh, insightful uh, conversation. Thanks, Chris. Talk to you later. Cheers. Okay. Bye for now. Thank you.